This is the Chronicles Podcast, a production of Chronicles Magazine, the original outlet for paleoconservative thought and a bastion of the authentic right in America. Well, welcome to another episode of Chronicles Magazine Podcast. I'm here today with The Prudentialist, and we're happy to talk about um, a figure that's sort of lesser known but important in in regards to the paleoconservative movement and where it's been over the last several decades. So thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me on. Always a pleasure. So who's the thinker that we're talking about today? Uh, we are talking about the late and great Joseph Sobrin. So uh, people don't really uh, – I don't think a lot of people appreciate him or ha- are familiar with him. He's got a couple collections of essays on Amazon, um, but he was he was important for a while, and he's probably one of the best prose writers that I've come across – um, you know, within the, within the American 20th century scene. So let's let's start first with a little bit of your own background before we get to Joe Sobrin. Um, you're you call yourself the Prudentialist. What does that mean? Uh, sure. So I feel like the story behind the name is always way less uh, entertaining <laughs> than what it actually is. So um, uh, I created the name out of sort of a a, a love for a, a colleague of mine who's called the Distributist, but I'm not a Roman Catholic, so I thought, why not come up with a different name? Um, and at the time, you know, prudence of forethought, the prudence of planning of our forefathers. My original profile picture was Edmund Burke because I thought the most interesting line he had ever written in, you know, Reflections on the Revolutions in, of France was criticizing the ability to change the laws and rights of others, of those who have gone before you, but those who have not yet been born. And so his concept of inherited rights has always stuck with me. So th- that's how I started. And now I, I do more advocate for more sort of traditional lens within things, both within the context of Christianity, but also that's why I find myself really identifying, I guess, mainly with the paleoconservative camp, because as we'll talk about with Joe Sobrin later on in this discussion, is that a lot of the things that Sobrin discussed, you know, it's we, we keep rehashing them. And I feel like a lot of people need to realize that his writing, his work, his talks are very valuable because, you know, he kind of already tread that ground before. Right. So you mentioned inherited rights, and that's, I think, one of the things that really separates out the paleoconservative demeanor, you know, that paleoconservative mindset is the fact that they don't see – they see history as um, being the provider, the development of history being sort of the provider um, for our way of life and looking to history and our own people, our own heritage and culture comes out of something very specific and particular uh, to who we are. And I think that is one of the one of the losses that we've had over the last several decades has just been this emphasis on universalism. And that's come across with liberalism and it's also come across with neoconservatism, with this, which is a type of liberalism. And Joe Sobrin was really representative of the type of personality that would fight against that universalizing mentality. So um, how did you find Joe Sobrin and what made you want to read him specifically? Have you read anything else before the essay that we're gonna talk, or the, the novella that we're gonna be talking about? <laughs> Uh, well, no, I, I started like many people, I guess, who are under 30. I started just going through various talks and whatnot uh, that I could find online. And thankfully, he's been prolific in conferences and talks like that. So most of his C-SPAN appearances, I've seen, um, you know, his focus on, you know, uh, media and academia, accuracy, accuracy in academia was one of the projects he was a big part of. So I've seen most of those discussions. Um, his writing, not so much, although I have ordered some of them. And I know that there are some of his essays that are online, which I, I plan to dig into more. But listening to him talk and retread a lot of the things that I see today on Twitter, Substack, and sort of the right wing scene overall makes me realize that there is sort of a goldfish memory on the right in some instances. Maybe this just comes with the cycle of a new blood coming in, which myself is definitely included in that list. And I can't help but think to myself, you know, there's a lot of these questions that we keep asking ourselves very existentially. Um, you know, these things have been tread about before or have been interrogated by people like Joseph Sober. And he gave a fantastic talk in, I think it was 1990, about the media being the handmaiden of big government, that they're in bed with big government. And, you know, for us, that's a concept that we take for granted today. But, mm-hmm. you know, to listen to someone 33 years ago outline it succinctly in that 20th century, 1990s cable media complex was very endearing to hear, knowing that he more or less predicted the evolution of what was to come with the internet. 
Okay, so what is what is the book you're reading and, and what insights does it have um, for us today? Sure. So um, one of the, it's actually the way I found Joseph Sobran was the, the 2018 book by George Hawley, the uh, right wing critics of American conservatism. And, you know, when you're, I, I have worked in the Republican Party in the past, I did a lot of electioneering and things like that when I was in college and university. And, uh, you know, 2016, kind of, of course, for many people changed their understanding of how party politics worked. And that if, you know, the traditional low taxes, small government Reagan conservatism isn't the way, I might want to look up people who are different. And so when George Harley published that book, I started going through and finding names that I had heard about before or didn't find one. And Joseph Sobran was one of those individuals that I had not really heard about, but I had known that he's sort of one of those more infamous characters that was canceled by, you know, William F. Buckley. So I mm -hmm. thought, well, maybe we should go read into this guy, because if you've made William F. Buckley Jr. mad, then you've probably done something right. So I, I started reading that. And then one of the essays I asked um, a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Carson, who goes by Radical Liberation on Twitter and YouTube, who's a fantastic, a man who's met everybody, I think, and he's met Joseph Sobran when he was still alive. Uh, he told me to read... Um, notes for a reactionary or for the reactionary of tomorrow which is this novella length uh essay which i'm still going through which has been just a a delight to read about a man whose prose and his ability to think about what the next 30 years is going to be like um it was just very prescient and i've been enjoying that read so far Let's talk about um, the context of that. So you, he wrote, uh, was that in the 70s when he wrote that? I think it was the 80s. The 80s. Okay. So um, talk about what he saw, you know, in, in the world around him and in, and why he was using words like react. Like we talk about reactionaries today in 2022, but we live in a post uh, woke world. We live in a post conservative world. We really live at the height of, of a very revolutionary society. Um, he saw a lot of this. That was 50 years ago. What did he see then? Um, you know, what was the context that was happening around him that caused him to write what he did? Sure. So he's writing this in 1985. So we're right, we're right in the middle or right in the beginning of Reagan's second term. We're sort of beginning to see where the Reagan revolution is going. But he's also highlighting sort of the <laughs> last 40 years of the American 20th century and what has emerged from very similarly to that old right tradition about what came in the night of revolution and then what came in broad daylight in the civil rights revolution and that laws and the rules of society have always been made by the strong they're exploitative for the weak but the weak are to be protected uh, and he's sort of highlighting this very understood concept of how the american government was to work and he highlights it in this essay and his other talks in the 1980s and 90s that you know, the American founding fathers of today would think that they wandered into Canada if they had came into the country nowadays. And so he's sort of highlighting that the democratic process that the country once had, you know, you're inheriting something completely different. You're inheriting something that's under the guise of colorblind, affirmative action, federal civil rights law, uh, which is neutered the neutral character of the law, and that for tomorrow, you're going to have to recognize these things into the 2000s and beyond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, politically, did he was he was he optimistic or did you do you think he was more of a, a pessimist or did he really not get into that? So far, I, I think that he's highlighting some of the natural instances of where order comes from. I mean, uh, one of uh, one of the phrases that definitely stuck out to me was uh, civility is natural, even in a band of gypsies who live by theft and fraud need to have some rules for conduct among themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the West, civility has been developed as a principle for cultural reasons. Christianity made it a basic distinction. Uh, and I think that as I keep reading through here and as I've been taking notes, I, I plan to have a, an essay on it on Substack shortly because it's something that I think people need to read has been highlighting these natural tendencies that seem to get lost by the wayside in legalism, legal speak, and bureaucracy of our government, where if you can hold true to the natural instances of civility, culture, and religion, you have a chance to see your way out through the worst. And he was very predictive both in this essay and his numerous discussions um, that you can find online. I highly recommend that people look him up. Um, he He's very adamant that things are going to get worse, but there are ways and means in which it can be recovered. 
One of the things about Joe Sobrin, I think, is that he, uh, and, and this is true of all the paleo conservatives, is is they're very cynical about the prospects of um, converting the masses, using the masses um, to like, because th th that's the rhetoric we hear all the time. Like, we need to fight the regime, we need to mobilize the masses, need to wake up. And but that's I, Joe Sobrin and others like him recognize that that's not the way that political society functions. Um, that masses. Uh, are malleable by those who are in power. Um, and so he he really had an aristocratic mindset and and recognized the fact that elite minorities are are the the, the change agents within society. So talk a little bit about that, like some of his hesitancy toward like mass politics and mass democracy as a prospect for for hope. Absolutely. So, I mean, Joe Sobrin has been very adamant. And I mean, his love for Shakespeare cannot be left out of this discussion, right? Uh, he's... <laughs> um, probably one of the better people to go to when taking a look at how we can interpret Shakespearean works and apply them to contemporary politics. And he <laughs> uses it both in, um, in this essay, but in numerous others in his talks, wherein he's firmly ca uh, capable of understanding that it really is just a small cadre of characters mm -hmm. um, that are going to, to move things along. And, you know, he's been very skeptical, of course, with respects to mass democracy or what we hear all the time nowadays is that more people just need to wake up and realize how bad things are and then things can really change. Whereas, you know, Joe Sobern is very adamant about the fact that really, you know, for a political career, if you actually want to institute change, like when you start doing mass politics or what, what gets called social democracy, you get into this uh, form of you know, alienistic expressionism where we're looking at the world in a way that is not natural. It is usually very small groups of men and an elite that moves things. And so when we like try and look at the world through this lens of mass democracy or this large bouts of popularity, um, you know, the only way that you can get that to happen is usually by taking advantage of technological process and enslaving mass minds. And so, I mean, you're seeing references to, to Orwell and Tom Bethel. I mean, writers that kind of fundamentally understood how that ratchet moves. And so Bren's able to weave that and recognize that if you want to have mass politics and mass democracy, things are going to go to heck in a handbasket very quickly. He has the word reactionary in the title there. Um, does he is he explicit about why he chose that word? Is he is he trying to distinguish between, you know, a reactionary politics and a conservative politics? Is that part of his argument? Uh a little bit. I mean, uh, we, we we start looking, he, he does get into the word liberalism quite a bit. And I mean, actually, when we look at the entirety of the text, reactionary comes up three times, okay. uh, twice inside the essay, the first one in the title. And so, you know, the first time that we hear the word reactionary in this essay um, is when we're looking at the concept of liberalism. Um, and he's very quick to point out, very similarly to how a lot of Polish conservatives will call out communism, is, is that liberalism may be faintly embarrassed by certain twists in such communist policies, but it is essentially at home with a whole idea of population policy or populism. Um, whereas, you know, if you look at, say, The Demon and Democracy by Rosario Lugutko, and I think that was published in 2018, he's highlighting that, well, a lot of post, you know, communists that were part of the Communist Party, they just became social democrats because liberalism has a lot of similar goals as to the communisms uh, or as communism does. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, he points out that liberalism as a political system, a political philosophy, a political science, uh, will take active measures, quote, uh, to prevent reactionary views from being heard. Behind every double standard lurks an unacknowledged single standard promoting socialism. So really, for him, his idea of a reactionary is one who stands as a vanguard against socialism, social democracy, sort of totalitarian control of a system. I mean, this is written in 1985, so you've got that Cold Warrior instance with it, but I mean... Today's, you know, Red Square marches and things like that, you can see that every June and for pride parades and the <laughs> marching into progress for mass populist control over all sorts of things through social engineering. We see this all the time with the Tavistock Institute. I mean, these things are prominent and prevalent because it is a way to keep people in these basic assumption groups for what is acceptable. And if you step outside that basic assumption group, as Joe Sobrin did, or many sort of paleoconservative or quote unquote reactionaries today do, um, you find yourself being thrust against the uh, the wall, not by communists or socialists, but by people that would describe themselves as liberals. Right. So he, I mean, he really had on his mind, I mean, 
communism was at the forefront of the political theater at that time. Um, but he, do you think he had an element of the liberal threat, you know, the establishment liberal threat? Um, do, is that any part of his essay? Um, oh, yeah, at all? A, a, okay. absolutely. He spends quite a big, a large section on the issue of religion. So, of course, Joe Sobran is uh, probably one of the better Catholic writers that you can find um, into, you know, in, in the 20th century on this issue. Uh, he had this little strong command of um, church history, uh, Christian doctrine, and of course, fellow Christian writers of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton. And he talks about how liberalism will try and avoid directly assaulting religion. You sort of get that secularist differentiation between church and state. But, you know, believers are viewed by both the socialist and the liberal as reactionary because mm -hmm. they're not adhering to sort of the secular in the world kind of mindset. And that is especially, you know, is a part of Christianity to be in the world, but not of the world. And he recognizes that to follow and to be a true adherent to that, um, you are going to be attacked by both what we would call socialist communists, but also by the liberal system, even if not directly, but indirectly, it will work through other means. Okay, so do you think he saw religion as as a fundamental in terms of, you know, fighting for our heritage? Like for him, you, he couldn't conceive of any reactionary or, uh, you know, meaningful traditional politics without the religious aspects to it. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, you, you'll see it in this essay, too. Or I mean, even though he's I mean, he's quoting Lewis, who's an Anglican. But I mean, you know, some people might say they like may dislike Milton's God when they really mean they dislike God. And mm -hmm. for in this essay, but also in numerous other talks that you know, Christianity, especially for the United States, you know, even though he's a Roman Catholic, I mean, it's a fundamental part of the American culture and the American heritage and that no real authentic reactionary movement, uh, one that stands against the tide of socialism or liberalism, for that matter, you, you need religion. It, it's absolutely essential. And I think that even today, right, when we see people rail against the woke, I mean, most famously, you know, the everyone's favorite quote unquote like lol cal right would be james Lindsay, and of course where does he get his start i mean most of his early academic work is on the issue of atheism still is it about atheists and has the gall to criticize christian doctrine and he wonders why at the end of the day he'll side with liberalism over anything else that recognizes what the actual structural problems are which is a failure of liberalism to contain the worst instances of itself mm -hmm. Let's let's connect Joe Sobrin and you know some of your interests. Um, you know, I, I, having a prudential politics is part and parcel of um, you know that paleoconservative mindset, and Joe Sobrin really embodies that. So, so talk a little bit about like, can you connect some of the themes in Joe Sobrin with like sort of the anti-universalist trends uh, in the modern conservative movement? Absolutely. And I think probably the best way to to frame that, and especially when we before we started recording was that, you know, I, I found him in 2018. I found him just a few years ago, and I just started listening to a lot of his talks, started reading some of his essays, I bought some of his collections. And to me, it was this side of bit of humility, this bit of being humbled. And I think that there's not a lot of that in today's political scene, in part because the media landscape is completely different. I mean, I think you and I could probably agree that if we got 50, you know, right wingers in a room, paleocons, all sorts of different types of old right, new right individuals, that you're going to get 100 different opinions on maybe one policy position that we want to put forward and whatever kind of government that we want to run. And even then, that would lead to 100 other discussions about what kind of government we're going to have. Right. This is the same sort of stuff that Marie Rothbard talked about in the strategy for the right in um, 19 in the 1990s, very shortly before his death. And I, I read this essay and I'm, I'm reading it. I'm taking my notes. I'm referencing all of the, the writers that he's referencing. And I realize that there's this very short term short term memory in this sort of media state that we live in. We um, almost like we're in debord society of spectacle, but in this instance, everyone is in the society of the hot takes and political commentary. And so there's this lack of foundation inside of our, our intellectual canon. And I think that Joe Sobrin, for me, you know, he's he's got it. You know, he, he understands his writers. He understands the English Western canon. He understands American political history, but he also has a firm understanding of what is happening and what is to happen. And I think that a lot of people, uh, especially for people like my age, I'm, I'm, I'm 27 going on 28. To me, it's really important that we don't lose sight 
of these, you know, more contemporary writers, because a lot of people will tell you, you know, read older books, read textbooks before 1950, read history before 1950. Um, but I, I, I think that we do ourselves a great disservice because that ignores, of course, the last 60, 70 years where we've really gone off the rails in this country. And, you know, Joseph O'Brien, like many of his contemporaries, of course, like Dr. Paul Gottfried um, and numerous others, right, they are essential for our understanding. How did we get here? Um, you know, we can rely on the ancients as much as we need to, but we also need to rely on those that have already fought the good fight before us. And so uh, Joe Sobrin's understanding of how there isn't too much of a difference besides methodology and maybe some of the things that they believe um, between liberalism and communism alongside the need for religion, understanding that civility is a natural, innate thing for us. And that you look at today's society and you realize that a lot of what Sobrin's writing about has been this abdication of, you know, civil responsibility. But these things can only happen if you have a majority of people that are instituted from a higher power, both God, but also an elite governing in this world that can help institute that because culture does come from within ourselves, but it also has to be maintained by law and order. And that always raises the question, what order? And Joe Sobren is the guy to go to to find out what that order really means and how that can be upheld and where that can be found. Um, I, I agree with you. And I, I, I like what you picked out of Sobren. And I think he has a lot to say. Like one of the one of the things that really separates, um, you know, Sobren style paleoconservatism with uh, just everything that's gone under the banner of conservative um, as a movement over the last uh, dec several decades has been um the the the, um, the applicability of these uh these particularist versus universalist themes on the on the issue of foreign policy and um you know this is this is one of the things that I think that the conservatives younger conservatives and right wingers had to rediscover was restraint in foreign policy um it's just part and parcel of, of protecting who we are and our heritage and I think um just mindless wars mindless militarism overseas that characterized uh, you know the even you know the bush the entire bush uh decade uh, has really done a great disservice to this country and our our natural and cultural cohesion. So, so talk a little bit about because I know foreign policy is something that is interesting yeah. to you. So, just talk about some of the themes um, that you drew from Sobrin and connected to foreign policy a little bit. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Sobrin's call for cultural and political restraint, realizing that once you let you know the sort of genie out of the bottle, you unleash the sort of liberal Pandora's box wherein. Uh, we sort of tried to divorce ourselves from Christianity, law, and the traditions which build the country. And it, again, it echoes this very old right, you know, Alfred J. Knock, Garrett Garrett style of America should probably not be entertaining this notion of getting engaged with the new world. And I mean, you know, you can sober in the people's pottage, I think, are, are very good <laughs> two things that people should be reading together, especially when you read like X America, Rise of Empire, and then you start reading Joseph Sobrin, you can see that there is this influence that is inside Sobrin. And, you know, if Sobrin were alive today, I think he probably would have loved uh, Barry Posen's book in 2018 called Restraint, uh, A Case for a New American Grand Strategy. And so a book which I've reviewed on my YouTube channel and elsewhere, which is highly recommended for anyone who wants to understand foreign policy, because you know, for a lot of people today, we are sort of in this post 9-11 world wherein the, you know, the Bush administration, which only got compounded by Obama's, you know, troop surge, the drone strikes, the pivot towards Asia, we've really witnessed a fundamental transformation of what the American tradition of foreign policy was. And that tradition was to escape the old world and to not be involved. Now, that has radically changed since the Spanish-American War, where we've really started putting our foot out there. But our, you know, we've abandoned things like the Monroe Doctrine in respects from that when John Kerry was Secretary of State. And Sobrin and a lot of the paleoconservatives of his era offer an understanding that you there are existential threats out there. And I mean, in Sobrin's case and in America's case in the 1980s, it was the Soviet Union. But there are other threats from within that you also have to deal with, and that if you cannot deal with internal threats, whether that be, you know, uh, anarcho-tyranny or lawlessness or the abundant disregard for religion and civility, then you're not going to be able to project yourself as a power to the rest of the world. And I think that we definitely have seen that play out when we look at 
you know, a quote unquote progress flag on every American embassy across the globe, even in places like the Holy See and Vatican. And so for us, especially for younger people, those that may not have been around in the 1980s or those that don't remember the Cold War, you know, for me especially, that's why foreign policy has always been interesting to me is because I'm an army brat. And so I, I grew up under the Bush administration. I grew up under the Obama administration. And um, first ballot I cast for president was, you know, in 2016. I voted earlier beforehand. But, you know, it was a change in foreign policy where I've been trying to, like, divorce myself and deprogram myself from that sort of like Bush era American adventurism, you know, we can do anything. And then you look at the world today, and you're like, no, we really can't. And the more that we do this, we're only making things worse at home. And so Sobren, you know, not just in this essay, but in numerous talks about foreign policy and culture, highlights the need for restraint in a way that can maintain the balance of power and maintain an order that is civilizing and good but you cannot have that unless you have order, civility, and tradition at home. And if you abandon that, then good luck trying to manage any kind of empire or foreign policy that's remotely sane. Mm -hmm. You know, even like someone like Ron Paul, you know, he he would always connect what was going on, um, you know, in foreign policy with domestic policy. He's like the idea that you can just separate the two. Um, it, you know, it, it's a massive, um, you know, misunderstanding of things. And so, like conservatives at home would just always emphasize, like, you know, some of the domestic themes about you know values and all that stuff. But then they would go and become reckless overseas without even realizing that the two needed each other. You know, you needed a, um, you know, a, a foreign policy policy of restraint in order to restrain um you know what was going on on the on the home front too and that's one of the things that um uh, you know libertarians at least the older style libertarians have been good on and the paleo conservatives also um talk a little bit more about um the, the context of, of sober and so he got axed by buckley he was part of the purge the paleo conservative purge um do you know anything about the specifics of what happened there uh, well, primarily having a, a nice chat with the Institute for Historical Review and trying to <clears> defend <throat> himself against charges of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. um, which I think also had spear-charged his desire to have accuracy in academia in, in media. And I mean, those institutions, or I mean, I know IHR is still around and, uh, you know, trying to ask questions and the historical narratives behind the Second World War. I mean, that is, goes part and parcel with what, you know, Dr. Gottfried most in his most recent book about anti-fascism is, is that that really is the sort of mythological foundation for Western liberalism post-1945. Because if you were, there's a great tweet that I think kind of highlights this instance where someone had said, well, if I oppose drag queen story hour, if I oppose, you know, the transing of kids and I oppose, you know, all these other things, what does that make me? And, you know, so the reply was like, oh, you you would be a Nazi. And he's like, thank you. Right. Like, that's the answer. <laughs> and it really does illustrate that, like, well, if that's your ultimate evil, if that is the ultimate ontological problem, you know, then one, you're still ruled by Hitler. And then two, um, you know, that does give you carte blanche to make sure that that never happens again. And, and Gottfried's book is um, that that one out of all and that and after liberalism are my two favorite works of his. And of course, though, when you start questioning those things or trying to look into it, and you can get labeled very quickly as an anti-Semite or a denier of various things. And, you know, that's a big part for what got him canceled and axed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting that um you know like because Buckley was you know he was kind of um the door like you, you know if you don't get Buckley stamp of approval you're not part of the movement you know mm -hmm. uh in that mentality I mean they were the original cancel culture which is hilarious because you know though all of those people they were the ones that were liberalizing the conservative movement the whole time and pushing the undesirable conservative voices outside of it. and the idea that someone like you know a, a good traditionalist Catholic like Joe Soberin has no place in the conservative movement uh, it really makes you think you know about the history of what happened with the conservative movement and what was really going on um behind the scenes there so uh, let, let's expand our horizons out beyond uh, foreign policy a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the other themes that are that are uh, you know personal to you that you've you've taken a lot of time on and connect them with some of the themes that you've drawn out of Sobrin. Sure. Uh, I mean, for I think for starters, right? Like one of the most important ones would be, you know, it is is a product of growing up in in this century. I mean, you know, the earliest bits of politics I can distinctly remember, of course, would be new atheism, which is diverted into two separate directions because you either became like a hardcore 
you know, human biodiversity scholar, or you had became like what we would just call the woke nowadays, because it held these two axiomatic presuppositions at the same time that I don't think were entirely compatible, which were everybody's equal, but like evolution and science are absolutely true. And then you're going to run into some awkward things there. Whereas Sobron was very quick to highlight that as well in his various talks. I mean, the one he gave about accuracy in media and the bigotry of tolerance you know, he's highlighting that there are differences between people. You see this in culture, you see this in height, you see this in immutable characteristics. Um, and so to treat everyone as equal, to treat everyone and to be tolerant of the fact that people behave differently, that people have different cultures, that we're going to interact with everyone in the same way is foolhardy. And I, I think that we're still seeing that today where, you know, the what he might call the bigotry of tolerance has been something that has definitely gone on the whole way where we look at things like, um, you know, famously that baker in Colorado that is constantly harangued and targeted for not wanting to bake cakes for various things that go against his Christian faith. And, you know, the the memeable bit about it that gets turned into the, the soundbite is to like bake the cake bigot, you know, and so uh, that tolerance of bigotry is definitely held on from the 23 years since he gave that talk in 2000. And, you know, Sobrin to me highlights that there's also problems that are not just secular problems, but they also exist inside uh, the Christian church. Because even though, regardless of your denomination, when we're told to be, you know, of the world of, of one mind within Christ Jesus, um, this doesn't mean that the secular, the liberal aspects of American society aren't going to have an impact on clergy. And he was writing about this in 1985, but he says, you know, the he, he, he says, quote, you know, the liberal clergy sees no tension between the sacred and the trendy. They virtually identify the two, hailing their own leftist protest as prophetic, as if they are um, defying contemporary currents of power rather than being swept up in them. They are embarrassed by dogma. They adapt their theology to politics. Now, this is in 1985. But I mean, you look at various pride flags and Episcopal churches, you know, um, drag queens giving sermons or, or you know, female pastors or priests, uh, which is, uh, um, you know, having like rainbow little parts to their cassocks and whatnot. It, it does illustrate that, you know, what what's seemed to be revolutionary only aligns them with a very power structure that seeks their destruction. And so, I mean, you again, it's that sort of liberalism may not attack you directly or a full frontal assault, but it will find ways to infiltrate and subvert. And as someone who is a Christian, I find that to be very important that we not lose ourselves to the spirit of the age or be like some, you know, like especially in like the 1920s when some Russian priests decided to side with the communists. Uh, I don't think that we should be doing the same thing either when it comes to the, the liberal spirit of the age. And, you know, to hear Sobrin write in 1985 that, the very thing where we see people saying, well, you can't be punk unless you're like anti-racist, then, you know, your ideas aren't revolutionary. You're just part of the power process. And to see that happen to the Christian church is just depressing. Sure. Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, have you read Sobrin's essay, The Reluctant Anarchist? Yes, I have. Talk about that. I like that essay. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I read that when I was, um, you know, a libertarian. A, a lot of younger people like myself went through that that phase. But I really I've always liked that essay. It's one of my favorites of him. And I think people should read him. But um, can you talk a little bit about like what he was what, what some of the themes that uh, of that essay and how it applies today? Because you would think because a lot of people who are new to this stuff, they don't understand how someone can be like a reactionary traditionalist Catholic and interact with themes of anarchism. So just talk a little bit about uh, you know what he meant by that. Sure. So uh, for context, like the the reluctant anarchist is from. Uh, Sobrin's newsletter, it came out, I think, in 2002, one of his uh, later works when he still had his uh, essay, you know, I mean, it's, his website's still up, you know, Joseph uh, Sobrin.com, which you can find it. Um, and, you know, and he, he's sort of highlighting that, you know, is this sort of introductory letter of like, well, you know, you might be wondering how a conservative and a, and a deeply Catholic man is flirting with the idea of, of anarchism, because I have a deep respect for authority, but we need to understand that um, America has this particular, and I think he calls it peculiar form of patriotism, where we do rebel against things that we find to be tyrannical, that is an innate part of the American culture and spirit. And, you know, he talks about this in respect to his Christian faith as well, that um, even as a deep, you know, deeply religious Catholic, he recognizes that there are things that we have to rebel against 
whether that be, of course, liberal clergy or, you know, the spirit of the age, we must use that to rebel against the world. Um, and that the conservatives of his time and the people that he's interacted with, whether that be, of course, Bill Buckley or sort of the Rothbardian libertarians of the 1980s, is that the world that we live in, this conservative movement that I was a part of, it spent more time trying to lie to me about what the world actually was like and how the world actually operates than it was trying to deceive everybody else. Um, you know, he's like, I went in there being honest. I went in there telling them who I am, what I believed in. And they were feeding me this worldview and feeding me how things actually worked that I didn't find to be true at all. And he calls that the conservative illusion. We're in the the center of the right of that time, even conservative courts, you know, they're not going to throw out liberalism. They're not going to throw out the liberal legacy of, you know, the state. They're not going to do anything about it. They have to play inside the system. He's kind of calling out the beautiful losers thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he he comes to this conclusion reluctantly. It's, it's a very short essay, but it's a great read that, you know, we, anarchy kind of makes sense in a, in a system that, is meant to co-op, contain, and play along when it's not going to do anything against these threats to civilization. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm about to pull a you know a major crossover here, but it kind of reminds me of um, Younger's concept of taking the forest passage, like his own anarch. It's not. It's not this ideological anarchy, but it's this situation in we in which we find ourselves under the like the totalitarianism of the administrative state. And we have to, we can't commit ourselves, we shouldn't commit ourselves and our souls, the deepest aspects of our, of who we are to either party, like as if, as if they were two contesting political factions, right? We shouldn't uh, commit ourselves in an ideological way to any political regime because what's happening in the world um, is so total and it's so hegemonic that one has to have like sort of a, a mentality of an anarch or um, you know, which is what what uh what younger call them the you know the anarch. He's not an ideological anarchist, but he is someone who puts his head down and he does recognize that he is not committed to to anything or anyone, you know, except for taking this uh this sort of this forest passage. And I kind of see um a similar you know analogy here with with what Sobern is trying to get across. Um, so have you? So let's let's expand on on that a little bit uh, in terms of like because we always talk about like what are solutions? How do we recover this? What are some political I mean, options that we can take? But just as an individual, I mean, do you have you found yourself thinking about you know how do you how do you live your life in light of the crisis? Sure, and so yeah, I think it's important, right? I think that's actually a very good crossover between younger and and Sobrin, right? Because the the anarch, or in this case for Sobrin, really, it is because you know, he's, he follows Christ, right? And that's to de it's sort of the ultimate anarch because you're not meant to be of the world um, or you're not meant to be in it. So like no, no state, no politics, you're out to go and preach the gospel. And, and so for, I think a lot of people that has always been the ultimate question because you can talk about the crises all you want. You can write a million essays, but everyone's going to ask the same question. Like, well, what is the praxology? What do you want to do? And when you look at that system, right, it, it go, it, Sobern and I would probably agree on that same issue. Well, I really don't want to conserve anything here. A lot of this is awful. It needs to be burned down. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people ask, though, what what can you do about it? I think that the and I think Sobern would probably would have agreed would have been like the Catholic principle of subsidiarity that you have more power based upon geographic proximity. And so. America, you know, as much as we try to have this like American identity, this post Civil War um, reconstruction, especially in the 1910s and 20s, uh, where, you know, it's America, the nation, the United States are, it's still incredibly regionalized. You know, the mm -hmm. Midwest is the Midwest for a reason, the Pacific Northwest, there's a specific type of Portlander or Oregonian that you're going to see in the same way that someone from San Francisco is going to be entirely different from someone like me who lives out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And so I think that regionalism has got a, a really innate, it's, it's in the blood of the American people. And what I when what really has triggered this thought more recently was that a friend of mine recently had given me a gift. It was a, a birthday present, belated, but it was, and I actually have them right here. But they were preserved um, current paper currency from the Confederate States of America, and you know they were from the states, you know the state of Louisiana, the state of Alabama inside the Confederacy, and you know having family that participated in the side of the Confederacy, you know hung Yankees and things like that, just made me think that there's this tradition of regionality that i don't think 
America's completely abandoned, you know, like people who are born and bred in New York City hate it when people come to New York and then like don't adapt to the culture that they don't assimilate to the the trends of the city. The same thing for anyone living out in the sticks. And I can't help but think to myself when we look for solutions, you know, the Internet sort of gives us um, sort of this troll gaze or we, we look at the clickbait, we look at the the tweets by the he him you know profiles on twitter and react to them but we fail to look outside our window and see what we can do my political view on things is that if i can plant the you know vine and fig tree that my grandchildren will sit under and not be afraid then everything i have done in my life has been worthwhile and i have accomplished something and i think that the only way that that can really be accomplished is to take stock of your surroundings your self-worth your value what do you actually believe in are there people around you that can do that? And can you influence others that may be empowered to do so? So, I mean, you know, I've, I've printed out sub stacks of my friends. I attend my county GOP meeting. I mean, like my county GOP chair reads people like Gottfried, like Orrin McIntyre and the rest. So I like to think that maybe I've done a little bit of good in that respect. But you have to start locally because a lot of people get swept up in this idea that American politics and that the culture of America, the city on the hill in D.C., you know, is this grand sweeping nationwide political meta narrative. And it really isn't. It really has to do with the people you know, the connections you make, and what kind of effort you're willing to put in. And it doesn't matter how many times that you tweet or how many times that you, you know, point out hypocrisy or double standards. You know, double standards are the only standards that liberals have. We know this. Sobrin wrote about it. And so we we do kind of have to embrace that that little bit of anarchy inside of us in that respect that I have my values, I have my traditions, I have things that I want to preserve, and I know that the like the state, especially the federal institution of our government, isn't going to do that. So I've got to start taking matters into my own hands. And the only way that that starts really at the end of the day is, well, who is my neighbor? Can I break bread with them? And can I trust them? Yeah, I agree. And I think that exposes some of the problems with ideological politics. I mean, this is consistent with Sobran across the board in the sense that, you know, asking who you are and remembering where you came from, because those things are so um, intensely part of you, um, even beyond the realm of rationality. You know, they, 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 they govern your instincts and they govern your sentiments. And I think those things are entirely consistent with the way Sobran saw the world. And, and, and just asking who you are can mean, um, you know, a, a variety, like a cascading levels of of, of answers and solutions to that to that question we are american um but but we also are you know part and parcel of, of the region in which we came and there's there are folkways and they are very different and um they they do they do help us uh they give us a hedge uh between us and um the goings on of, of washington dc and i think that's important uh to remember so do you have any last thoughts on sobern in general or any last thoughts on on um, that essay and anything that you are going to make mention of in your own reflections on on the essay? Yeah. So the the one thing that I will definitely be reflecting on, and I, I think that for younger listeners out there, for those that are trying to understand where younger paleoconservative or dare I say reactionary people are coming from, is, is that for people born in the 1990s and after, there really is this break in traditions um, where there's this memory that has been lost. It's faintly there and people are trying to find that light in the darkness. And, you know, reading these essays by Joe Sobrin and listening to his talks, I'm hearing things that have come out of my own mouth without ever hearing him before and thinking that I had said something original. And there's nothing new under the sun as the old adage goes, but to hear it from somebody who's been in that fight, you know, more or less his entire life, who adhered to his beliefs, who had recognized the problems of the institutions and the groups that he worked with and to write about them, to me, it was a real waking up moment for myself to recognize that, you know, what I'm feeling or these observations I'm making are much older and much deeper and are much richer than a lot of younger, you know, pundits or essayists and commentary people realize. And I think that, you know, a lot of people who are, say, under 30 or even under 40 are really trying to recognize, well, where do these traditions come from? Where do these like lines of thought of politics come from? And we're, we're rediscovering them. And so, you know, we're, we're thankful for like Chronicles Magazine or the Charlemagne Institute and, and Sobrin's own works and various other publications because there's that there's that treasure trove, that access to memory and political thought that hasn't been 
as accessible to us before because it's so easy to lose sight of memory and history in the digital age where people's attention spans are, are rattled to oblivion, where people live and die by the Twitter trend cycle for takes and for positions and essays and videos. And they don't realize that there are, you know, thoughts and essays and people whose words are far more perennial and far more lasting than anything that we might make. And so um, Joe Sobran is probably one of those people that we need to rediscover uh, certainly appreciate more of and for his work to be read by much more people, especially younger people today, because he kind of called it out, you know, 30, 40 years ago and was pretty dead on. And so we should probably listen to the people that got it right. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And I, there's this phrase by Richard Weaver, um, you know, he calls it the Ciceronian tradition of eloquent wisdom. And there's just something about reading good prose uh, because you could have facts, you could have like like little truths, but when you when you put it together in a string of like um of like well written and eloquent sentences, uh, it really speaks to the soul in a, you know in a much deeper way. And I think that's what you can get out of someone like Joe Sobran, who's a master uh, in the art of writing. Um, so it's not it's not just the ideas, but it's it's the experience of of reading someone um, and 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 seeing the fruit of that um, Ciceronian tradition of eloquent wisdom, which I think Joe Sobrin captures so well. Um, so where can people find you and uh, plug whatever you want to plug? Sure. So um, again, I'm the Prudentialist. I also go by Matthew online. Um, you can find me at findmyfriends.net, F-R-E-N-S dot net slash the Prudentialist. I am on YouTube, Substack, Telegram, Twitter, anywhere where there is audio and video, you'll probably find me. And um, once again, thank you so much for having me on. It is always a pleasure to speak with people that have access to this tradition and root of like-mindedness and to appreciate a writer that I hope people my age and younger um, start to read more of.